and welcome to this revision video. This is for AQA and it's on kinetics. Uh, my name is Chris Harris. I'm from alloytutors.com and the whole point of this video is basically just to do an overview of um, kinetics, making sure that you, you've got all the, the key bits really, um, just uh, really good for just a little bit of revision on kinetics. And um, just before I start, the uh, PowerPoints that I'm going to be using on here, they can be, uh, they are available to purchase for whatever you would like to do with them, print them out, add notes to them, you can do, um, you can look at them in your own time, whatever you want to do, um, really, they're, they're all there. Um, if you just click on the link in the description box uh, and the, underneath this video, uh, and you should be able to find them there. So, you know, please um, go and use them. Um, that's exactly why they're there. Okay, so I like to say these things are specifically designed for the specification, so um, uh, for AQA, so they're the um, specification points on the front of the slide. Okay, so let's make a start. So we're going to look at rate and collision theory. So uh, obviously kinetics to do with uh, rates of reaction, how fast things go. So for a reaction to occur, they must collide. It seems a bit obvious, I suppose. Um, but we're going to look at rate in particular. So rate is the change in concentration or the amount of a reactant or product per unit time. Okay, so we're looking at changes of these things. So rate is basically the amount of reactant used or product made divided by time. You've got to remember this rate. It's really important. Okay. Uh, particles can move all the time and they do. They're constantly moving unless they're obviously at absolute zero. But, you know, it's virtually, um, it's really difficult to get to absolute zero. But so we're not going to look at them. We're just mainly going to look at obviously particles in normal conditions. So they, they move all the time and they collide into each other. But most collisions don't actually lead to a reaction. Um, so when they, they hit off each other, they just bounce off each other. They don't actually react. So really, for a reaction to occur, the particles must collide in the right direction. So the right orientation. And they must have a certain amount of energy for them to collide. We call this the minimum kinetic energy. This is moving energy. So um, that's really important. So let's have a look at something called activation energy. Now, this is basically the minimum amount of energy required for a reaction to occur. Um, this is basically what we're talking about. This is the energy that's needed, the minimum amount of kinetic energy needed for a reaction to actually happen. Um, this is not talking about collisions. This is for a, an actual reaction. So uh, we can use an energy profile diagram and it can show changes in a reaction. You can see here, in this example, we've got reactants on the left and products on the right. And we're looking at the energy change in going from a reactant to a product. Now, the molecule, um, the bonds are obviously stretching, uh, or molecule bonds stretching, um, as they have a lot more kinetic energy. You've heated them up, and they are starting to move around a lot more, as you probably would expect. I mean, you'd move around a lot more if we started heating people up. So uh, <laughs> molecules are exactly the same. So... The um, activation energy, this is the minimum energy required for this reaction to occur, must be met before the reaction can actually take place and we get products produced. So the activation energy is the difference between the reactants and the top of the reaction profile line. Okay, so um, this is really important. You can see this gap here is the activation energy. So that's the amount of energy we need to put in. So at this point at the top here, uh, bonds have the sufficient enough energy for them to actually break. And that's what you need for a reaction to happen. So reactions that have a low activation energy need less energy to break them. Uh, and um, obviously normally less heat energy as well. Um, and vice versa. Okay, so if they have a high activation energy, then you need lots of energy. So we use something, or you might see something called the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. Okay, so Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, that should say Boltzmann. Uh, Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution shows the energy in gas particles. Okay, so particles in a gas sample, they move at different speeds. Okay, so move slowly and so move quickly. So they're not all moving at the same speed. And they have different amounts of kinetic energy. And we can display this on a Maxwell-Boltzmann plot. So here we've got one here. So they're normally shown with number of molecules on the left and kinetic energy on the bottom. And here's our reaction profile. So the graph always starts at zero, zero, because no particles have zero kinetic energy, unless obviously you've got absolute zero, but that's incredibly unlikely. So um, this one always starts at zero, zero. Uh, the area under the curve is equal to the total number of molecules 
Okay, really important. You've got to know that a little bit. Okay, and this bit here is the most likely energy of a particle in a sample. So that's the bit where it peaks, but that's different to this bit, which is the mean energy the particles have. The mean energy is always slightly right to the total, um, to the most likely energy of a particle in a sample. Don't get these mixed up. Okay, this is the mode, this is the mean. Okay, make sure you don't get them mixed up. Very, very important. Okay, um, this little bit here is the activation energy. Now, this obviously has an energy higher than most particles would have. So, this is over here. And obviously, particles, um, um, particles that are over on this side have very little energy. They move a lot, lot slower. They don't have much energy. Particles in the middle, these have, um, this is most particles because we've got a big area under here. And these move with a moderate speed. But crucially, particles in this section over here, um, these have energy that's greater than the activation energy. This means that these particles have enough energy for them to react. And this is where you produce products. You can see most of the particles in our sample don't actually have that energy. So you can kind of get an idea of the energy needed for this reaction to go. Okay, so what affects the rate? Okay, so temperature affects the rate of reaction. So particles, on average... Um, have more kinetic energy when they are heated. So a larger proportion uh, of molecules will have energy greater than the activation energy. Now this is the red line here. You can see here this is a higher energy, a uh, higher temperature. Very important things to notice. The red line crosses once with the original line. The peak of this curve is lower than the original and it's shifted slightly further to the right because we have more energy or more particles with more energy. The activation energy, the area beyond the activation energy, is greater than the area than it was before because you have more particles with area greater than the activation energy. Okay, so these are your key points that you need to know. Okay, but crucially, the area under both curves is the same. Okay, uh, right. If we look at a cooler one though, this time, so this time I'm going to decrease the temperature. Um, when we decrease the temperature, a smaller proportion of the molecules will have energy greater than the activation energy. So this is the blue bit there. And you can see, look at the area underneath the activation energy. Really, really low. We don't have as many particles with energy to react or sufficient energy to react. Again, key features here. The curve shifts to the left. You see we've got it really squashed up to the left here. Peak is higher than the original one that we had before. Area under the curve is the same, of course. And the activation energy area is going to be smaller for ones that are lower in temperature. Okay, uh, right. Okay, so what affects the rate? Why do we get a faster rate of reaction when the temperature is increased? We need to be thinking about collision theory. Okay, so basically particles move around more at higher temperatures. They have more kinetic energy. So they, this means they collide more often and hence the reason why the reactions happen faster at higher temperatures. So here we've got some gases here we heat these up they'll move around a lot more and they'll bump into each other a lot more often so the combination of more collisions and more energy more energetic collisions means that we've got a small increase in temperature leads to a large increase in rate really important say that again small increases in temperature leads to a large increase in rate okay so if we increase the temperature just gradually we get a very very large increase in how the rate of reaction how fast it goes must make sure you've got this faster more frequent collisions and and you have more energetic collisions so it's like a double effect okay concentration and pressure they also affect the rate as well so effectively if we increase the pressure the particles are obviously being moved closer together so that means they've got a higher chance of more frequent collisions and a higher chance of a reaction so obviously we've got the two diagrams here and we've got a low pressure here with the particles obviously a little bit more spaced out and this time we've just decreased the size of the box but the particles are much closer together higher chance of collision so that means obviously the rate of reaction um, could increase Concentration is pretty much the same, uh, same principle. Again, the particles, we have a higher concentration, we have more particles in the same volume of space. Um, so therefore the concentration is higher, they're much uh, closer together, more late to collide more often, more frequent chance of these collisions. So here's one at low concentration, 
here's a high concentration you can see there's more an increased chance of the red particles bumping into each other um, and therefore that could lead to a higher chance of a reaction for concentration um, catalysts also affect the rate so there's a lot of things that affect rate here so catalysts what these do is these are a substance which increase the rate of reaction because they provide an alternative pathway that has a lower activation energy okay that's really important they remain chemically unchanged at the end of the reaction so they they're not actually used up or if they are they're reformed again okay so that's really important for a catalyst so what they do is they speed up a specific reaction different catalysts are used for different things so and they're used to make the product faster uh, and they can be used to lower the temperature of the reaction as well. So less energy is needed. So that saves a little bit of money as well. Uh, here's an example of one. This is zeolite. Um, so zeolite is a bit like a like a honeycomb structure. Uh, large surface area, loads of micropores in there. Um, and so this means that you can um, get um, much more efficient reactions. Your reactions happen a little bit quicker. So how does a catalyst affect rate? So let's come back to this Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. So remember we looked at the activation energy. A catalyst will lower the activation energy by providing an alternative pathway for the reaction to happen along. So on the Maxwell-Boltzmann curve in particular, the activation energy shifts to the left. So now what we've done is we've increased the area um, of the um, particles with energy sufficient to um, lead to a reaction so that's what a catalyst does it shifts that activation line further over to the left and if we look at our energy profile diagram well what a catalyst will do is it will lower this activation energy so there's the activation energy with no catalyst if we uh, carry out the same reaction with a catalyst we get a reaction profile like that and you can see the activation energy is now lower and um, less energy is needed for this reaction to happen Okay, so how can it be uh, measured in experiments? Okay, so we can, depending on the experiment, we can obviously look at um, different ways in which we can measure it. If our experiment produces a precipitate, we can basically time how long it takes for that precipitate to form. Uh, one of the classic examples you might have seen is the disappearing cross reaction. So we place a cross on the bit of paper, put a beaker over the top, and basically time how long it takes for the precipitate to form. And you're obviously looking down the top of your beaker here, looking down here and as soon as you see the cross disappear underneath and um, then you stop the stopwatch and um, obviously there's a problem here um, it's really difficult to be know when the cross has actually disappeared and um, you've got quite a room of error here and um, deciding whether it has or has not disappeared and when to stop the stopwatch so there's a bit of an issue there with that one uh, you could also do the amount of mass loss as well this is great for reactions that produce gas we just put the um, the solution on a top pan balance like this and um, we put our um let our reaction go we've got gases that produce the gases escape out of the top and we can measure the loss of mass particularly useful for gas and um, fairly accurate method um however if the gas is toxic you've got to use a fume cupboard so you've got to be very mindful of that uh, the volume of gas produced um is another one so you can measure the volume very similar to the other one i suppose um, but this is this time we're using a gas syringe so we can measure, obviously, um, over a specific period of time. We can set it away for a minute. And say, right, how much gas do we produce over the minute? So there's our um, reaction producing gas. The gas goes up here into the delivery tube, into here, pushes the syringe out. You've got to do it over a fixed period of time, and you just repeat the experiment using different, um, using a catalyst, perhaps, changing the temperature, etc. And we can monitor how much gas we produce over the minute. So they're pretty important reactions used to measure in the experiments. And that's pretty much it. So short and sweet, that's it for kinetics. Um, like I say, you can uh, get a hold of these PowerPoints. If you just click on the link uh, in the description box and you'll be able to get a hold of them there. But that's it for now. Bye-bye.